an announcement to make to y'all, to the people of America. The mothership has landed. It's the classic guitar rock podcast. Gentlemen, if you'll examine your charts, please. Let me show you a clip from my latest film where my faulty depth perception kept me from yelling cut at the proper time. When dealing with powerful criminal elements, one can never be too well prepared. Fact, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberry. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. Now don't call me Shirley. First thing you do is to get the psychological edge on your adversary by showing supreme confidence. Oh, 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 Joe Foley told me he read that in the National Enquirer, the only paper you read the truth nowadays. I told you I am in command here, and I will give the orders, Captain. All music is important, Dick. It's the universal language. One of our best hopes for the eventual realization of the Brotherhood of Man. You get all these crazy people that come and throw these junk on stage, you know. I thought it was one of these rubber bats. I picked it up, it was a real bat. Is you know. it alive? Well, it worked till I bit the head of it, you know. The taste of bats is very salty. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Ready to move out. Before we start, I'd like to say something. There's no reason why you shouldn't have complete confidence in your chances to come out of this thing alive in one piece. From coast to coast, from border to border, from one end to the other and all points in between. The Classic Guitar Rock Podcast is on. Yes! That's awesome! We crank up and break down the great guitar-driven rock of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you are invited to come along. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes, it's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it! And now, your host... Jeremy Lunnan. Yeah, we don't know anything about that fellow there. Well, who is he? Where's he come from? It's time for the Classic Guitar Rock Podcast. Hello, welcome to the Classic Guitar Rock Podcast. I'm Jeremy. Uh, May 9th, 2023 is the dateline. Let me be frank with you. So, I've got my my empire, right? I, I say that. Jokingly, my wife refers to it as my empire. Uh, I've got like, I don't know, 16,000 YouTube followers. <laughs> and I've got the podcast. The podcast actually is, I wish I would have started the podcast a lot sooner. When I first thought about it, five years before I actually started it, I, I would have a lot more traction. The, the podcast is doing pretty well. And if you're a content creator and some of you if if you're listening if you're a podcaster if you if you have a YouTube channel you've only got so many hours right in a week and it's like do I spend my time on YouTube do I spend my time doing the podcast and I try and kind of tie the things together keeping in mind that I do this for fun right this isn't intended to be the way I make a living and I may completely change my opinion <laughs> over the next few days but you know I, i've just been thinking every podcast episode gets a, a a number of listens and you can um get some ad revenue from each episode and if you're only doing one a month or or two a month then that's what you get right and then so so part of me is like well if i just publish more episodes i would have more listens i would have more ad revenue and all that's true but the, but the balancing act is you don't want to dilute what you're doing right if you went to a daily podcast obviously you'd have more listens but would it be fewer listens per so so there's this algebra that goes on in your mind and at the same time would it make more sense to be doing it on youtube versus the podcast and i'm saying all this just to say I'm going to try and experiment, and you guys are part of my experiment. I'm going to put out a lot more podcasts. Part of me was thinking I'm going to do a daily podcast. And I thought, well, man, to, to, to do a full episode once you edit it, once you record it, once you do a little research. I mean, it, that's I can't do one every day. Could I do a couple a week? I don't know. We'll see. But uh, where am I going with this? I'm going to start 
publishing a lot more episodes. And uh, guys, feedback is super important. And if you guys don't <laughs> don't want to hear more, let me know, right? Or if you think doing more episodes is a good idea, I'd love to hear that too. Please email me, classicguitarrock at mail.com. And it's a balancing act between this and between the YouTube channel. And I think what I'll start doing is I'll be posting podcast episodes on YouTube as well. But then you get into a whole nother can of worms there. If you use any type of music, even for bumpers, that gets flagged on YouTube. So I basically need, need to do kind of two different versions of the podcast. One that goes up as a podcast and then the other that, that goes on YouTube. It's a struggle struggle. But anyways, thank you so much for, for tuning in. I got a few things I want to talk about today, and I do want to get to some emails. I do have uh, at least one email that I want to share with you. Again, the email address is classicguitarrock at mail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you have questions, comments, complaints, criticisms, let's talk about them. I'm, I'm happy to share those things. So uh, I've got one email here from Alan. Uh, Alan says, hello, I just discovered your podcast and so far I'm really digging it. I'm a little disappointed there haven't been any recent podcasts. He sent this right before I posted the last one uh, about a week and a half ago, but to certainly understand how life gets in the way sometimes. I enjoyed the episode on Ozzy's Guitarist and liked how you mentioned how Gary Moore and George Lynch were pivotal figures in his early career even if they never toured or recorded with him. I also agree with your take regarding Brad Gillis and the Sabbath covers. My take on that was, this might be controversial to some folks, I like Brad playing Sabbath tunes better than Randy. I'm not saying I like Brad better than Randy, but you could tell that Brad loved the Sabbath. He was a Sabbath fan. Randy was not a Sabbath fan and didn't like playing the Sabbath music. And I think it shows when you listen. I don't know if you knew this, but Marty Friedman also auditioned for Ozzy at the same time period as Zach Wild. The story I heard is that while they liked Marty's playing, Sharon was concerned that he might come off too much as a clone of Jake image wise. Just as well, Megadeth's Rust in Peace is one of the finest classic thrash albums of all time, and I can't imagine it without Marty. Tornado of Souls might very well have the quintessential thrash metal solo. In any case, I hope to see more podcasts soon. Thanks, Alan. Alan, thank you, my brother, for that uh, email. Thanks so much. And uh, any of the rest of you, please email me at classicguitarrocketmail.com. There's, there's a lot I want to talk about just in this email. I had heard that Marty auditioned during that that time that they got Zach, that Zach was auditioning. And you mentioned the George Lynch and Gary Moore pieces. Very interesting parts of the history. George Lynch was, in fact, he was far enough into the process that he was actually touring with Ozzy He'd play during the sound checks and he, you know, I think they were planning on George being the guy. And then Jake comes in and Jake tells a story about seeing George get fired right in front of him. They just fired George right in front of him and, and say, Jake, you're the dude. And this also kind of shows the role that Sharon played in a lot of this. For instance, one of the things they didn't like about George was George had a day job. He had a family. He's like working uh, for a, for Anheuser Busch or what, or he was like dr drove a beer truck delivering beer to stores, and so he had a day job. He had short hair, and this was a problem for Sharon. Very image conscious, right? Conscious, right? So that was a strike against George. So ultimately, they they wound up bringing in Jake. But what a lot of people don't know is when Randy left to join Ozzy, most of his students went over to George. George took on a lot of 
of Randy's former students. So obviously George and Randy knew each other. There was a relationship there. And it's interesting to me how you see, especially back then, it was a small, the, the hard rock community was a pretty small community. Gary Moore was in Southern California. We talk about in that episode how Gary was kind of trying to help Ozzy put together his band. And of course, Ozzy wanted Gary to be the guitarist. And Gary didn't want to do that, but he was helping. So they'd come in and uh, if they were auditioning someone, Gary would come in and he'd play guitar if they were auditioning a bass player or he'd, he'd play bass if they were auditioning a guitar player. So Jer or Gary was just kind of there to help. But yeah, it is funny when you go back and look at the history and and think about some of the might have been's that could have could have happened. Marty Friedman, you know, had he been in the band, that what would that have been like? Michael Shanker is one of the names that came up. Could you have imagined Michael Shanker with Ozzy Osbourne? That would have been interesting. But uh, a lot of interesting little tendrils in the Ozzy story. And I would encourage you to go back to that episode. There's an episode called uh, Ozzy's Guitarist. There's also an episode about uh, Blizzard of Oz and that whole process of Ozzy leaving Sabbath and, and the recording of Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman. And then um, the Black Sabbath Matters episode, I would also recommend. Those are all great episodes if you're if you're a fan of Ozzy and, and his guitarist. But Alan, thanks so much for the email. And I'd love to hear from any of you. Classic guitar rock at mail.com. Now, just a few news items that I want to get to really quick. Ringo Starr's all-star band is announcing their fall 2023 tour. Now, I don't know if you're aware of Ringo's all-star band, but this has been going on now for what? 30 years? And what Ringo's all-star band is, it's just what it sounds like. And to be honest, Ringo is kind of the figurehead. And the older he gets, the less prominent role he has in it, to be honest. But it's it's really cool. I mean, it's really cool to go out and watch videos of these bands. And he's got some, some uh, regulars, right? Steve Lukather is often a part of the all-star band, Edgar Winter, Colin Hay, who was in Minute Work. They've had the guy from Mr. Mister in there. Billy Squire has been part of the all-star band. And so here's what they do. He assembles this group of all-stars and they go on tour, top-notch musicians. They play, you know, the biggest hits of each of the guys in the lineup. Uh, and then they just will play some other classics. And so if you ever have a chance to see Ringo's all-star band, well, beginning in September in Ontario, California, uh, clear through October. Th so, it's, so it's really a kind of a short tour, uh, tour. It starts September 17th, ends October 13th in Thackerville, Oklahoma. If you're in one of those towns where they're coming, I would really encourage you to see it. You're going to have a great time. You're going to hear great music. You're going to hear a great catalog of music. So you're going to hear stuff from Toto. You're going to hear stuff from Minute Work. You're going to hear Edgar Winters stuff. You're going to hear Beatles stuff. It's a good time. And it's always fun to see how the Ringo's All-Star Band changes over the years. I, I mentioned other people have been in it, right? The guy from Mr. Mister, Billy Squire, so it just kind of depends on who's in the lineup as to what music you will hear. But definitely uh, worth your time to go check out Ringo's All-Star Band. Another little item that I thought was interesting. We've talked about Foreigner. We've talked about how Foreigner, Styx, Journey, pretty much any of the classic rock bands... None of them have original members. Kiss, obviously, we can throw Kiss to the mix. And so it's always this question I throw out to folks, especially the ones that are really, really diehards about only seeing the original lineup. And, and the question I always throw out, would you rather your favorite band just stop touring, no more live music ever, or would you rather they continue with non-original members? That's the question I throw out. 
So Foreigner is one of these acts that has been getting quite a bit of grief from the diehards because let's be honest, the only original member in the band is Mick Jones, a guitarist who's like 78 years old now. And he literally, I think at this point, plays one or two songs. He'll come out at the beginning and play one or two songs, and then that's all he does. The rest of the time, all non-original members. Are you okay with that? Or would you rather that Foreigner would have just called it quits when Lou Graham left in the early 2000s? So this news item I have is actually uh, Jeff Pilson in an interview. Jeff Pilson, of course, was in Dokken. He's in a project called Black Swan. He's currently in Revolution Saints. Very active musician, great bass player, great singer, and a great producer, and a multi-talented guy. Currently, he's touring with Foreigner and has been for like 10 years. And he says, you know what? When we play live, we don't get any grief. No one complains. No one says anything. They they love the show. And full disclosure, I'm going to see Foreigner this summer when they roll through Spokane. I'm going to go see him. I've seen, not in person, but I've seen live, you know, on YouTube, I've seen lots of live Foreigner shows with this current incarnation, and they're really good. They sound awesome. Excellent musicians. Kelly Hansen does a great job singing the, the Lou Graham tunes. What's not to like? But in an interview, Pilsen, you know, he, he basically just said, you know what? People come out, they love the shows, and we never get any negativity. We never get any complaints, which makes sense, right? People that were going to complain probably wouldn't buy the tickets. I get that. But his point is, hey, we put out a great show. We're playing a great catalog, one of the great classic rock bands. It's a good time. And I I got to tell you, I kind of agree. I would rather go see the current version of Foreigner, which, which doesn't contain any original members, than not hear any live Foreigner music, right? And guys, that's the reality. That's the way it's going to be. If you're a classic rock fan, I'm trying to think of classic rock bands that actually have all the original members. I'm not thinking of any. There, there might be some, but if you want to see your favorite classic rock bands live, they're not going to have all original members. That's just the way it is. And, and Pilsen says in this interview that there's no complaints at our shows. I understand that, having seen their, their recent shows. It's just the nature of the beast, guys. We're all getting older. Our favorite bands are getting older. And that's just kind of the way it is. And so that's, again, I'll pose that question. Would you rather your bands just hang it up and you never hear their music live again, or they soldier on with non-original members? And then oftentimes people will say, well, it, 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 there's a spectrum, right? I can handle one or two new players if the core is still originally there. But when you don't have a single original member, and I'm thinking of bands like, well, Foreigners almost to this point, Blackfoot, you know, there are Leonard Skinnerd, right? There are bands touring that it's a very loose connection to any of the original members. That's not to say these aren't great musicians and you're not going to have a great time and hear great music. And to be honest, many folks in the audience, unless they're purists, they might not even know. Those aren't original members. I guess my only my only caveat would be how much are they charging me? Am I paying a hundred bucks to see a band that it's no original members? Maybe that's not too cool. You know, what about the Eagles? Henley, the only original member. Those tickets are gonna be several hundred dollars to see the Eagles. Henley's the only original member. Joe Walsh. Not original. He's kind of considered classic lineup. People are probably okay with Joe. Timothy Schmidt came in in 1980. Again, people might consider him close enough to an original member. But the Eagles tickets ain't cheap. Tell you this, a lot cheaper to see Foreigner than to see the Eagles. So again, how, how purist do you want to be? If you never want to see your, hear your band's music live again, then 
I understand the the purist standpoint, but but you're missing out on some good live music. I sound like a politician. I'm playing both sides of this argument, but it is what it is, and it's not going away anytime soon. Okay, I'll report back on the Foreigner show. In fact, this week I'm going to a live concert here locally called I think it's called the Hairball. And it's basically a live touring company that plays 80s music, right? It's total cover band, right? I'm okay with that. I love the music. It's cheap. My wife and I are going to have fun. I love live music. So I don't have a problem with that at all. And I'll report back on that too. Let you know how that went. Okay, now, when we come back, I have a very controversial topic I want to talk about with you. Don't go anywhere. The podcast Jeremy's mom listens to. She's probably the only one. The Classic Guitar Rock Podcast. Welcome back to the Classic Guitar Rock Podcast. I'm Jeremy. And um, I teased you with this statement that I have a very controversial question for you. I actually posted this on my Twitter yesterday. If you aren't following us on Twitter, please do. We are uh, on Twitter at Classic Guitar R1. At Classic Guitar R1. If you're on Twitter, uh, follow us. We do lots of polls, have a lot of fun there. But I asked a question yesterday and got a lot of responses on this. And my question was, now that a few decades have passed, when you look back at grunge, the grunge movement, the Seattle sound, whatever you want to call it. When you look back at the grunge movement, was that a positive thing or a negative thing to, to the music industry? Was grunge a net positive or a net negative? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Email me your thoughts. I have some pretty strong opinions about this, actually. And at the risk of <laughs> offending anyone or making anyone mad or people wanting to fight me in the parking lot, let's talk about grunge for a minute. And I don't want to sound like the, the old guy yelling at you to get off, get off his lawn, or I don't want to sound like an old fuddy-duddy. But as I look back on grunge, there are several things that grunge made worse. Okay. Now, let me just say this at the beginning. There are some talented bands that came out of that movement. There are also some good things that came out of it in terms of uh, shaking things up. I mean, let's be honest. There was hair metal was getting out of control and there was a lot of crap and it, it was just getting kind of ridiculous. And so, Every generation, every 10 years or so, we see these shakeups, right? We saw it with the punk movement in the 80, in the 70s. And to be honest, a lot of punk was crap, right? If you're, if you're talking about, and it's, guys, this is all, it's all, all we've got are our opinions. So obviously anything I'm talking about is my opinion. You might disagree. If you do disagree, I would love to hear from you and I'll read that on the air. Right. I would love to hear from you, but much of the, the punk stuff that came out was a reaction to what was going on with rock music in the seventies. And guys, I got to be honest, some of, some of the stuff they were railing against, I kind of liked, but I also saw the point that we had some of these big bloated overproduced progressive rock albums that just needed to go away or at least be challenged right the the much of the rock music in the 70s it was it was prime to be taken down a notch 
And so then all of a sudden we get this punk movement that, that had this different ethic, right? They weren't wearing bathrobes on stage. They weren't doing the extended drum solos and all this weird stuff. They were coming at you with two or three chords. They were wearing grubby clothes. They had mohawks. They had, you know, safety pins in their ears, whatever. It was totally new. And it really shook things up. Well, fast forward a decade or so, and the same thing happened with grunge. At the time, I mean, it's funny to go back and look at some of the tours, watch videos. You watch an Ozzy Osbourne video from the late 80s where he's literally wearing, you know, frilly nightgowns and got makeup on and big hair. Even Judas Priest, man. You look at the Judas Priest era of the late 80s, it's sad. They've got all hairspray, and even Judas Priest fell victim to the whole big hair, hairband crap. That was, again, ripe for a takedown. So I, I completely understand that. We they, they, they brought it on themselves in many ways. But here's, to in, in my mind, one of the negatives of grunge. First of all, I think the biggest negative was a record company problem. And this is typical of the record companies. And you notice one of the aftermaths of grunge, I'm not saying grunge caused this, but since that time, the record company influence, the structure, the way people listen to music, the way music is marketed, it's completely different. It's a completely different world than it was back in the 80s. But but one of the big negatives was the way that record companies handled it. R record companies are a complete me too. I don't mean me too in the sexual harassment sense. They're they're a, a me too in in the sense that they just copy. And this has always been the case with record companies. Something is popular, and so oh, we need our version of that. Okay, so one, you know, Nirvana's really big. Let's, oh, let's, let's book, let's sign bands that are just like Nirvana. Pearl Jam's really popular. Let's sign bands that are just like Pearl Jam until every record label is just signing. I know it would have been a great time to be a garage band in Seattle, right? Because it seems like they were signing almost everyone. And so we get all these bands that they become the trendy thing. And so, though, so what that meant is a lot of established bands, even if they were super talented, they couldn't get the time of day. I mean, think about, in my mind, some of the good bands of that melodic rock era of the 80s. You know, we had bands like Damn Yankees in the late 80s. We had Giant. Remember Dan Huff's Giant? And even some existing bands like, like a Van Halen or a White Snake, right? We talked about White Snake in our last episode. These bands were good bands. They were putting out good music. Y&T, even, who had been around since the 70s. They were putting out good stuff. But they went from being popular bands to all of a sudden it was like the record companies didn't want to hear from them. I know we yeah we realize your last album sold several million copies but yeah this but we're we're wanting to do something else. So what you saw was a lot of the existing legacy hard rock bands felt like they had to compete and so they well let's put out an album that kind of sounds grungy. Def Leppard, right? Their slang album. Dokken did it. Kiss did it. Most of the time it didn't work. Because it didn't seem genuine, right? This is a, this is a, you're a hair band, guys. We don't want you here. We don't want to hear you play grunge. So it was an interesting time, an interesting time because there were still bands that had big audiences, but the record companies didn't want to cater to those audiences anymore. And it seemed more dramatic with grunge even than it did with the, with the punk movement back in the seventies. Another thing that was a negative, I think, as a guitar fan, was the guitar playing just was not as good. I mean, there were some talented guys, 
But for the most part, it was kind of back to that punk ethos where it was just, you know, a, a, a lot more dumbed down musically. And again, I'm speaking in broads. There, there were, there were exceptions, but you know, guitar solos were kind of frowned on. You didn't hear cool ripping guitar solos anymore. So that was another negative thing. We went from this idea of showmanship, put on a great show, to, to now we have this whole shoegazing, the guys in their flannel shirts and scruffy jeans that just look at their shoes all night, and the performance ethos was gone with grunge. Now, again, this was a reaction. Some of it's a reaction to over-the-top stuff that we saw in the late 80s. I get that. But again, when I'm looking at net negatives, I think all of those things were negative. Much of what is attractive, and this is why this music is, is still popular, still coming back. People still want to go to these big shows and see Def Leppard and Motley Crue and all these bands from the 80s because guess what? The music's fun. I think grunge lost the fun factor. It became a lot more depressing a lot more broody and whiny, and it just wasn't as much fun. Again, that's a negative. Now, there are some elements of grunge that kind of morphed into a more poppy type alternative stuff that is doesn't really fit into that category. But, but you know, you look at the big bands of the time, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and again, there's some talent here. Don't get me wrong. There's some talent. They had some good stuff. But in general, wasn't as fun, wasn't as positive, wasn't as upbeat, right? And and also, we seem to lose that. I'm a sucker for hooks. I'm a sucker for catchy vocals that I want to sing along with. And we lost a lot of that in grunge as well. So I'm not going to lie. I kind of like the pop sensibilities that came with a lot of the hair, the hair band stuff that we didn't have uh, as much with grunge. So if you're going to pin me down and force me to make a, a decision, did grunge make things better or worse? Was grunge positive or negative? <sighs> I'm going to straddle right in the middle. <laughs> I'm going to say it's about equal, right? I, I, think, I think for as much good as it might have done, it did an equal amount of bad. And that's me. That's my opinion. I would love to hear what you think. Email me, classicguitarrock at mail.com. Now, let me say this. Many of the bands that got pushed aside because of grunge are coming back. And they're coming back big. And their stuff's really good. And I'm going to give you two examples. In the last month, Winger and Extreme. These are both bands that were really on the, on the, I won't say they were the biggest bands, but they were on the way up in the late eighties. Remember Winger? Remember 17? She's only 17. You know, all of that. Extreme, more than words. You know, wholehearted, extreme, extreme was on the ascent. What did they have in common? Well, they had a couple things in common. They had phenomenal guitar playing. Nuno Betancourt, Reb Beach were both on that forefront of the tasty, shreddy guitar. Yeah, they could shred with the best of them, but they were musical, right? They were talented. And I mentioned Giant earlier, Dan Huff. First call studio guy had a band, Giant, great guitars, great production, great vocals. So there were several bands that were just on the cusp. We were expecting big things from them, and then boom, here comes grunge. Everything changed. These guys are kind of not cool anymore. Winger especially. You guys remember the whole Beavis and Butthead thing, right? The kids wearing a Winger shirt. And, and they'll say, yeah, when they were making fun of us on Beavis and Butthead, that was kind of the nail in the coffin. Well, I challenge you to go listen to the new Extreme stuff and the new Winger album just dropped the whole album. You can go stream it. 
And I was reminded again how talented both of those bands were, Extreme and Winger both. Musicianship, vocals, songwriting. I'm going to get in trouble when I say this. It's better than anything that came out in the 90s. Okay, I know I'm biased because my wheelhouse is the classic rock, the melodic rock stuff. But it's really good stuff. So I'm, I'm leaving you with the challenge to listen to the new Winger album. Listen to the new Extreme. I don't know if their whole album has dropped, but like three or four songs are, are out so far, at least. Listen to the new Extreme. Listen to the new Winger. Listen to a group like Revolution Saints, which is from that classic rock mold. And I would submit to you that, to me at least, it's it's more satisfying than any of the grunge stuff. That's not to say there aren't some grunge, grunge songs I like, but I want to hear what you think. Am I just an old fuddy-duddy? Am, am, am I out of line here? And now I'll share with you the, the results of my poll on Twitter, at least last time I checked. So last time I checked, when I posted that, when I asked folks, was the grunge movement's impact on music negative or positive? It's about a 60-40, probably more 65-35, positive to negative. So about 35 to 40 percent think it's net was a net negative. 60 to 65 thought it was a net positive. I'd love to hear what you think. There might still be time for you to respond to the poll on the Twitter page. That's great. I'd love to hear an e email from you. Tell me. If I'm wrong, let me know why I'm wrong. Maybe I've missed something. Maybe I'm I'm not being realistic here. If you agree with me, I'd lo love to hear why you agree with me. But the good news is, for those of us that are dinosaurs, like myself, <laughs> a lot of these great bands from the late 80s are coming back, and they're putting out good music, and there's good stuff out there. So it, it's a great day to be a classic rock fan. Thanks so much for listening. I'd love to hear from you. ClassicGuitarRocketMail.com. Until next time, this is Jeremy. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Classic Guitar Rock Podcast. Oh, sweetie. Please like, subscribe, and share. You can email us at ClassicGuitarRock at Mail.com. We're not ordinary people. <laughs> We're morons. We'll see you for the next episode of the Classic Guitar Rock Podcast.